Hello and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host Jason Turner. I am available for code reviews, contracting, and on-site training. As an aside, since I often get asked this question, what does that actually mean? If you're currently working at a company that is working on a C++ project and you would like some uh, feedback on the design and techniques that you're using and where you could improve, then you could hire me to do code reviews for your project remotely. And if you are looking to increase the overall knowledge and skill level of the employees at your company, then you could hire me for uh, training for me to come in and do anywhere between one and five days of training depending on the needs of your organization. This episode is episode two or chapter two of five in my special 2019 Christmas class. Now this is 2020 today of course but the class started in 2019 in the week between Christmas and New Year's and we will be continuing it through for the next five more episodes. This is the second episode, chapter two of five, and then the sixth episode will be answers to the homework questions from episode five. This lesson is going to be a collection of talks and information about how we can use the properties of, of lambdas to our advantage while programming. I've also titled this the building on lambdas chapter. So I want to make sure that if you have not yet watched the last chapter, go back and do that now. I'll wait here. Did you go? Okay, so now that you have gone through the first chapter and done the homework assignment from it, because this is going to have spoilers having the answers to those homework questions, now you can come back here to chapter two. So this is where we last left off, and these are the homework questions that we had last up, as well as the list of episodes to have watched to have gotten all of the background material. So my first question was, come up with reasons for wanting lambda to function pointer conversions. And there are a couple of reasons here why you might want them. The most obvious one is when you're interacting with a C API that just needs a function pointer. So if we had some sort of C API that expected a callback, and I don't know, it wanted to take an int and return an int because that's just the easiest way to do this. Whatever that looks like. Now we would be able to use this callback and pass it a lambda something like this. Now this isn't going to work because I'm in the global scope so I'll just go ahead and give this a quick function around it so that we actually still get our code compiling as we go along. So something like this. Now we have no idea what this use callback function does but it expects a function pointer and we can in fact pass it a function pointer. So if even if this were something coming from a C library, we would still be able to use it in this way and pass it to a regular old C function that's expecting a function pointer. Now the other reason that we might want a lambda to function pointer conversion could be to avoid the overhead of standard function while still allowing a generic set of um, functions to call. So let's just make another example of this here. Terribly named function. Uh, I need to include the vector header. And now from vector, I can do things like push back So I could add in a function here that adds the two parameters together. And I could add a function that multiplies the two parameters together, or whatever. And this may or may not be, although probably would be more efficient than using standard function here, but it kind of gives us a type of type erasure in a way. Now these must be non-capturing lambdas for them to be implicitly convertible to function pointers. So just keep that in mind. And let's see, 
ponder the practical application of inheriting from lambdas. And we are going to spend more time on this as we go through our class here. But the main reason that we would want to is to have direct access to the call operator. So as we already mentioned before, a lambda is just a class with a call operator. And if we inherit from that, we have direct access to that call operator. which looks something like that is the call operator overload. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Now, our third one is implement this Lambda in C++ 98. And this is my Lambda that calculates the Fibonacci sequence. So let's just go ahead and give this a more meaningful name. Probably should have done multi-column edit mode, but um, you know, not real fancy with that kind of thing when editing. So this is my Fibonacci. Now I want to create something in C++ 98 that would do the same thing. And I think I can do that. I have my Fibonacci struct and I am going to give it a call operator. Now, this is the generic form of the, what the call operator is in a Lambda when it's created for us. It is implicitly const. Let's never forget that. So let's go ahead and create our starting our values here. Those are our starting values. And then I had this in zero equals exchange. Now, you may, if you're paying attention here, notice that there's no way this can compile because this is a const member function and I am mutating the member variables. Now, mutable here, keep in mind, when we add mutable to our Lambda declaration, that is the same as removing const from the call operator. So this does what we wanted to, but this isn't C++ 98 actually. Standard exchange didn't exist in C++ 98, so let's just be a little bit more clear with what we need this to do. There. So that should accomplish the same thing that standard exchange was giving us. So we should be able to down here create an object of type fib and get the exact same result. Let's see, we were expecting five. Here we go. Five is being returned, in fact, from main. So there you go. This is what the compiler has done for us when we have done this C++ 17 style Lambda here using C++ 14's generalized capture expressions and the standard exchange utility and mutable here. Now also keep in mind if this were in fact C++ 17 then this would become implicitly a const expert member function. So there you go. That's the answers to questions 1, 2, and 3 on our first chapter in this special C++ weekly class. All right, now getting to chapter two. And as I already stated, this chapter is named Building on Lambdas. So there are six videos in this chapter. Now, if you watched the last chapter, which of course you did, because you wouldn't have just watched all of the answers to the homework if you hadn't watched the first chapter and gone off and done the homework assignment yourself, then um, you may recall that I put up here links to the episode to watch as it was time to watch it. Now, you may have noticed that uh, the sixth chapter or the sixth video in the first chapter didn't have a link and that's because it turns out that YouTube will only let me put five video links in as these pop-ups that come up here. So I'm not going to bother with the whole 
you know, go to the link on the side thing. Instead, I'm going to direct you more towards the uh, playlist, which is going to be at the in this video's description here, and you can just watch through the playlist and then come back and see the homework questions, or just watch through all this and then continue on with the playlist and see what the homework questions were ahead of time, because then maybe they'll give you some context while you're watching the next videos. Okay, so the next episode that you're going to watch, episode 150, Lambdas for Resource Management. And this episode is going to give you some ideas on maybe building on function pointer lambda conversions a little bit, using lambdas in conjunction with unique pointer, that kind of thing. Then you will watch episode 184, What are Higher Order Functions? Now, um, higher order functions uh, are kind of a key principle in programming in a functional kind of way. And since we're talking about lambdas, which gives you a really handy way of creating new functions, it seems like an important topic to cover. Then episode 48, C++ 17's very attic using. Now this is an important topic and when it comes to actually taking advantage of the fact that we can inherit from lambdas. So definitely be sure to check that one out. Episode 49, why inherit from lambdas? So we've already discussed the fact that you can inherit from lambdas, and then C++ 17 is very attic using, and then we're going to discuss why actually would you want to inherit from lambdas, and what are the possible use cases there. Episode 25, C++ 17's aggregate initialization. Now, Aggregate initialization, braced initialization, these concepts came into play in C++11, even though they had been in C for quite a while, because really there is no other way to initialize a struct in C. In C++11 we got that, in C++17 it was made more uniform, so it'll be something to keep in mind, and this also plays into uh, this inheriting from lambdas concept. And then episode 134, the best possible way to create a visitor. Now episode 134 is uh, really kind of wrapping up all of these things when it comes to inheriting from lambdas and aggregate initialization, variadic using, and all these things. So um, yeah, it's kind of the culmination of those topics. Now after you've watched all of those, your homework assignments for this week for chapter two will be only two. So this is really going to give us a great appreciation for the kinds of things that the compiler does for us, but also give us a deeper understanding of what lambdas are and how we utilize them. So this is implement this higher order function in C++ 98. And it goes something like this. Now again, if you're paying attention here, you might think there was no auto in C++ 98, so this is going to be really hard to do. And you're right, but also to make it slightly easier for you here, I am not using things like forwarding references, so you don't have to worry about implementing any of that in C++ 98, which would be effectively impossible anyhow. So I am writing a function called lazy, that is going to capture the function, the left-hand side, and the right-hand side, and it is going to return the call of the function with the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Now, this is going to be rather straightforward in that I am making this use integers here, but I don't want you to use integers. I want you to make this something that is generic and would work with any types. Now what this has done is this has created a function called our local function object that 
every time I call it, it's going to re-execute this adding of three plus four. So it's going to be lazily evaluated here. And, and that is the entire point of this. Now with this code, this is simply going to return seven each time. So let's go ahead and modify it a little bit. So let's just pretend like argc is some sort of an expensive calculation here. So each time we call it, it is going to take rdi, that is this first integer parameter, argc, and it is going to add it to the value 4, and that is this value here. And now each time I call this function, I have a function object that is going to add rdi plus 4, store the result in eax. eax is where the return value is going to come out of main here. It's also where the return value is going to come out of this lambda that we created for us. So this in C++ 14, actually this is C++ 11. Uh, in C++ 11, this is really straightforward and easy to do. In C++ 98, this is actually pretty darn hard. So I want you to play with this and practice writing templated code and practice writing code that um, uh, it gives you a better understanding of what the modern features are doing for us. All right, and then we've got one other homework assignment. And this one I'm not going to type all out for you here. I'm just going to link it. I want you to explain the difference. And I don't know why I'm suddenly capitalizing all of the words in here. Let's do this again. Since this is a question, not a title. So I want you to explain the difference between these two different pair implementations. So I'm going to give these unique names of pair one and pair two. Now the first one, if you're familiar with standard pair at all, it shouldn't be surprising here that these members are public. And in fact, that is how standard pair is implemented. First and second are public members. And then I've got uh, this one, which has no constructor. And I've got this one, which does have a constructor. This is a templated constructor with forwarding references that properly forwards the values first and second. Now standard pair actually has something like eight or 10, 12, I don't know, different constructors. It has very many. I have simplified it to just this one that can take these two parameters. Now, um, a couple of questions here is, What happens when I construct one of these objects for pair one or for pair two? And what is the const expert story here? Should pair two's constructor be explicit? Now I covered that a few episodes ago. And uh, how does this whole question about explicit affect pair one at all? Like, and so there's actually a, a fair bit going on here in these questions, and really a lot to think about when we think about forwarding of parameters to constructors and initializing of member objects and all this kinds of things and const expert and explicit and no discard and, and, and all of that stuff. So uh, give this a try as well. Um, if I remember, I will put a link to this in the video notes and then you can come back to this stuff and also um, have an easier way of starting out on the homework assignments. So thank you for watching this episode of C++ Weekly, this chapter two in our 2019-2020 class. Be sure to subscribe and come back next week for the next chapter.